Now we will hear from Doreen Whitner about CEDAW, the UN Convention for Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Doreen is Program Specialist at UN Women for the Asia Pacific region. Over to you, Doreen. Thank you so much. Um, do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, please do. Okay, good. And I hope I'll manage. Yes. Okay, um, that's the wrong slide. I start at the back. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for having me. It is a great pleasure. Um, I hope I can shine a little bit of light on CEDAW. Um, many, many people already are quite familiar with CEDAW. So if you feel this is too basic, if you feel I'm not giving you enough information or the wrong information, please put it in the chat and feel free to interrupt me at any point. I have a strong ego, I can handle it. Um, so, Let's have a look. Um, so CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination is of course the Bill of Rights for Women Globally. <clears throat> it was adopted long, long time ago in 1979 and came into force in 1981. Today, uh, 189 countries are, have ratified the convention. There are only five or six countries left, including the United States, Palau and Somalia. Um, who have not ratified. The only convention that has more ratification is the rights of the children. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about CEDA, we talk about very specific rights that are captured in the convention. We have altogether 30 articles, but uh, only 16 of them are actually addressing the core. We have article one to four when we talk about the general framework, what is discrimination and what is not. For example, temporary special measures is considered positive discrimination. So if we have um, a discriminatory um, section in the law or if we have an imbalance in certain rights to enforce positive discrimination to enact temporary special measures is not considered discrimination but just even out the um, uh, injustice that had happened in the past. Um, when we talk about CEDAW Article 5, we talk about discrimination and cultural practices. That is really important. A lot of countries actually put reservation on it, um, but the CEDAW committee is very clear. If a cultural practice discriminates against women, it is not an excuse. Cultural practices are not an excuse for discrimination. For example, in some countries, women don't have the right to divorce based on culture. This is not okay. This is still something that the CEDAW committee will bring up. Um, Article 6 deals with sexual exploitation. This is quite important. Here we talk about human trafficking and that women shouldn't be criminalized. But we also talk about women and prostitution or women sex workers. And here, this is really interesting. Um, the committee doesn't give ask a specific um, recommendation how to address it. Many countries have found different solution or uh, addressing the problem in a different way. For example, in Sweden, it was one of the first country where they actually uh, criminalized the buyer. Um, so the man who um, goes and, and purchase <laughs> the sex worker um, or um, other, in other countries, um, prostitution or sex work was legalized altogether. Um, it has certain back drawers. I remember specifically, I am from Germany. We, um, we legalized prostitution in 2006, but didn't uh, put proper regulations in place. So actually trafficking and sexual exploitation of minors increased. So everybody kind of has to figure out how to do it and find the best way for their country to deal with it. The CEDAW committee is just clear, avoid sexual exploitation, give uh, opportunities to women so that they don't have to engage. And if they engage, they are safe to do so. Um, Article seven talks about political and public right. Here we have the right to vote, to hold public offices. And here comes also in the temporary special measures quota for women and also how to empower women and the political environment to have a level playing field. Most of you know that um, 
the sweet spot for real participation is 30%. Only when women have 30% power or uh, seats within, within the national parliament or in decision making, can they make a real difference. Um, Article 8, participation at international level, there we talk about representation as diplomats or representation of the government at the different, uh, at an international level. Right to nationality, this is really important because often a woman, uh, once she marries a foreigner, she loses her nationality and she also does the, uh, the opportunity to pass her nationality to her children which can create problem if a divorce or one of the uh, people dies. Um, equal right to education. And that is actually a really interesting article because when you look at the global statistics, girls by now do better in education than boys do. Um, they have better levels and so on, but it's still a traditional, um, it is still traditional if the lack of resources that the boys will be sent to school. And often, unfortunately, higher education or higher grades in education doesn't translate into better employment opportunities for women. Here we come into Article 11, specifically on employment. There we talk about uh, maternity leave. We talk about uh, protection from se sexual harassment. We talk about um, lifting limitations, for example, that women are not allowed to work at night and so on and so forth. And of course, really important equal pay for equal work. Um, article 12 is on healthcare and family planning. I just listened to you on the debate about abortion. Um, CEDA is, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say as outspoken as I would like it to be, but at least what they have and one of their general recommendation is that they encourage the government when possible um, to lift uh, criminalization of abortion and that they withdraw punishment for the woman who engage in abortion and for the practitioner who performs the abortion. So that is as strong language as you get from CEDA. Mm, Article 13 looks at economic rights land rights, um, right to loan without having to ask your husband to sign off on it, and so on. Rural women, I think it's quite clear, especially in rural areas or in the Pacific and outer islands, women often do not have as many opportunities for employment, um, for, for education, often not much uh, access to legal systems either. So there it's really to make sure that rural women enjoy the same rights as other women in, in urban areas. Article 15 is about equality before the law. This is actually my absolute favorite. And I will come back to it because at the end, if we can't enforce any legislation, any laws, um, then CEDA is just a piece of paper and our national legislation as well. So equality before the law is pretty much the heart to make um, CEDA and national uh, rights enforceable. Article 16 goes into marriage and family. And here we talk about uh, prohibition of child marriage. We talk about equal rights to divorce. We talk about uh, inheritance rights and so on. So this is the core of CEDA. And these are the rights that if a country ratifies, um, they sign up to progressively implement. Often where implementing legislation is a, a question of resources, but of course that shouldn't prevent the government from actually enforcing it, but they might have to do it step by step. And there we come um, to, to the CEDAW reporting cycle where I will go into in a little bit. So, you will have noticed the core, um, the core of CEDAW um, provides a number of rights, but there are also a lot of rights missing. First, keep in mind when the convention was drafted um, so long ago, um, first of all, it was a debate uh, between the women's movement for almost 10 years. And then a lot of issues have come up over the last 30 plus years that the CEDAW, recommend, uh, that the CEDAW uh, committee or the CEDAW, um, yeah, the people who are responsible for drafting weren't aware yet. 
So over the time, the CEDA committee issued um, general recommendations, um, 38 at this point. Um, but we have to note the general recommendations are not legally binding. When a country ratifies, they are obliged to actually look at the core articles of CEDAW. But when it comes to general recommendation, it is more considered a guideline to consider these things in the CEDAW reporting and implementation as well. For example, we have um, general recommendation 14 about female genital mutilation. Um, we also have a general recommendation specifically for women living with disability. And I've listened to your uh, conversation earlier, and I think um, what could be clear in all the conventions and, and in all the uh, policies that are adopted is a clearer line uh, between physical disability and psychosocial or learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities because often women are all uh, with disabilities are all put in one pot and then one solution um, is proposed that doesn't really fit all the women that have different forms of disability. Um, unfortunately, uh, most of the convention are not very strong on that. Um, we have, of course, um, ending violence against women. There we have general re recommendation 19 and 35. 35 was just recently issued and builds on general recommendation 19. It's actually really quite comprehensive how to deal with violence against women in specific countries. Mm, general recommendation 27 is specifically on protection of older women a field that is often overlooked. In many countries, um, age-related poverty is a real problem. And given that women often live longer than men and have less um, employment opportunities, more responsibility for children, a lot of women actually slip into poverty when they come at an older, comes to an older stage age. Um, general recommendation 30 is on women, peace and security, where we look at women's participation in uh, conflict resolution and, um, and participating in peace building and so on and so forth. Um, we have one rather strong general recommendation mm -hmm. of women's access to justice. And the recent one that was just issued a few months ago was trafficking in the context of global migration. So we do have quite a big package of what is considered the CEDAW convention as a whole and what countries have to consider when they look at their own CEDAW reporting and implementation. Um, just really briefly on the CEDAW optional protocol, because it's often mistaken as a part of CEDAW, CEDAW uh, optional protocol is a specific treaty. Um, it, is, it needs to be ratified separately um, and it enables the CEDAW committee to receive complaints and actually look into specific human rights violation within a country. Um, this only women uh, groups or individual women can claim their rights through the CEDO committee only if they exhausted all national remedies. Only when they went through their system in the country and they didn't get their rights, then they can uh, use the complaint or the communication procedure uh, with CEDA. A lot of laws actually have been amended through this communication. Um, where women, for example, with domestic violence, the, the law wasn't properly enforced, women died, women's group took this to CEDAW, and the CEDAW committee approached the government directly to ask them for new legislation, and that did happen. So it can be a quite powerful tool that can be used by, especially by CSOs, to push for something at an international level. We also have an inquiry procedure where there is systematic and grave abuse of women's rights. The CEDAW committee can go in and inquire and actually provide uh, recommendations there as well. So who is the mysterious CEDAW committee? Uh, I've talked about them quite a little bit. Um, so there are 23 experts uh, on different fields. Some of them are more into family law. Others are specifically on economic rights for women. <clears throat> They are independent, so they don't have to um, represent their countries. They're independent experts when they do their procedures. Um, they are, however, recommended by their government. Um, they have a four-year term. 
and uh, the CEDO committee meets, looks at the CEDO reports from the government and has the constructive dialogues with government and civil society organizations. Um, I think it used to be three sessions per year, but the treaty bodies have, I think, financial issues, not enough funding. So I think it was reduced to two, but um, I'm not 100% sure about that, if that's still the case. Um, so let me just really, really briefly go into the CEDAW reporting cycle. Um, this, is, this is important because often um, CEDAW is a kind of stop and go engagement by the government. Um, the government remembers after four years, oops, we have to do a CEDO report, let's hire a consultant to draft it and then be done with it. That's not how it should be. Um, the CEDO reporting cycle should be that a government drafts a report. Most, uh, the, the ideal would be that the ministries, the different ministries, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Women come together and jointly draft a report that reflects the human rights situation of women in their country. They then submit it to the CEDAW committee and the CEDAW committee can look at it and issue the question. This is also when the shadow reporting comes in. The shadow reporting is the opportunity for civil society organizations to engage with the CEDAW committee. The shadow report is a reaction to the state report and shows the woman's rights situation from a civil society point of view. Often when you read the um, state report and the shadow report, you would think you're in two different countries because the perception of government and civil society on where women rights are in a specific country are often quite different. So once the CEDAW committee reviews the um, report and the issues that they were pre-sent to the government and they were addressed, then we have the constructive dialogue. We have a delegation from the specific country coming to Geneva and engage in a one-day dialogue with, um, with the with the CEDAW committee, with the 23 CEDAW committee members. I've attended that a number of times and it can be quite tough, um, tough engagement. The CEDAW committee doesn't hold back with their questions and often um, new ideas are drawn out and, and uh, human rights violations are discussed in quite detailed, in a detailed way. Um, Again, here the civil society has the opportunity to engage with the CEDAW committee as well. There are site events um, where the CEDAW uh, where CSOs can invite CEDAW committee members to give their perception, to provide their uh, view of what's happening in the country, and that is taken in by the um, by the CEDAW committee and then brought back to the government or actually issued in the so-called uh, concluding observations. The concluding observations are based on the shadow report, on the state report, on individual reports, um, and on the constructive dialogue, and gives the government around about 30 to 40 recommendation what should be done uh, within the country to advance women's rights. Um, since a few years, um, there are now always the so-called follow-up concluding observations. There are two to three um, most pressing uh, women's human rights violations in the country that the CEDAW committee asked the state to address within two years, not within four years, like the normal CEDAW reporting cycle, but within two years. Um, so then the government should go home, sit with the civil society. Again, that's the ideal, what should be. Most of the time it doesn't happen, but what should happen. The, CEDO uh, the, the government sits with the civil society organization, looks at the concluding observations and makes a plan how to implement concluding observations within the next four years. Um, as I said, often that's not the case. The concluding observations are received. Everybody gets upset about them. They put in a drawer and then in four years, they've been looked at it. But they are here, the civil society actually, and the uh, United Nations as well, it's also our job, um, we should push. We always should use the CEDAW concluding observation because after all, the government signed up for CEDAW, it's their obligation um, to now actually use this kind of cycle to make it happen and to advance women's rights. So let me come back to equality before the law. Um, when we look at, um, 
the CEDA general recommendations that we often have, um, it focuses very much on legislative change, on training judges, on um, doing more in, in the area of um, services, shelter, and so on and so forth. And that is super important. But when we have a look at the statistics at this point, uh, meaningful justice is not available for most of the people. And what I'm writing here, over 5 billion people do not have meaningful access to justice. This is not a typo, that is indeed 5 billion. There was the first global report that was issued in 2019, and they had a look at um, the justice that is available for all people. And that is the figure that they came up with. Um, about half of those people, the 5 billion, are women. They have round about the same justice needs, but as you know, um, women have more barriers to cross to actually get to the justice system. On the other hand, while we have this massive justice gap, we have also a justice sector um, that is massively overwhelmed. In most of your countries, the case backlog is considerably high. It takes years to get a case through and prosecutors, police and judges are completely overwhelmed when it comes to case law. When you have a prosecutor and have a prosecutor who has to address 500 cases, it is very unlikely that he will give, he or she will give the attention to a sexual and gender-based violence case the way it should be. On the other hand, we have only 10% of women who experience violence report to the police. So 90% don't even enter the justice system. 90% don't even claim the rights that they have on the CEDAW. When you look at uh, violence against women, it's around about 10%, only 13% of women report when they actually have a legal issue altogether. When we then finally have the woman reaching the justice system, conviction rates for sexual gender-based violence are um, so low. It is below 20% in most all of the countries around the world. And I'm not just talking about um, your country. For example, in my country, the general conviction rates for sexual and gender-based violence in Germany um, is by 11%. So we talk about almost 90% of offenders who get away with it. Um, on the same level, donor investment for justice has declined by 40% over the last 40 years. The problem gets bigger, the funding gets smaller, not a good balance. So what I'm saying here is if we only look at specific women's rights without looking at the bigger justice system, it is like trying to save the kitchen in a burning house. It doesn't really do much. For example, and I just use an example here that looks specifically at prosecution. And again, I use the country that is known for their um, advances in women's rights, right? So when we look at the prosecution, at the prosecution, that is where most of the cases um, are dropped when it comes to sexual and gender-based violence. On a global level, we have an attrition rate, that means what is dropped um, by around about 40%. What I listed here with Sweden is criminal cases in general. Criminal cases, it doesn't matter if it's murder, if it's robbery, if it's bodily harm, are also dropped by 38%. So even if we have prosecutors who are trained in, in gender-based violence, if we have police officers who are gender responsive and judges, the problem is still there because the justice system is not working for all, not just for women. So what I'm always proposing is let's move away from justice for women to women for justice. Let's look at the bigger picture. Let's have women promote people-centered justice so we can actually move with everyone, women, men, and children to increase justice for all. And then we definitely will increase justice for women as well. And how to do that? Um, definitely people-centered justice. We need to listen to people and need to know um, what is what women really need and not try to put them in an outdated justice system that was created 400 years ago. But on the other hand, it is also stop, not, don't just stop by engaging with CEDAW, 
look at the other conventions as well and bring in the gender dimension. When we talk about civil and political rights, when we talk about racial discrimination, when we talk about cultural rights, this is where the gender component needs to be brought in so that we can actually move the whole system and not just stop at the burning kitchen. And I think that's it. I hope I was clear. I'm super happy to answer questions. Um, I'm also very happy to listen to your comments and be corrected by you if necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doreen. Yes, you were very clear and we have not many questions for you. <laughs> uh, first is a comment plus a question. Very informative and in-depth presentation, Doreen. Uh, is CEDAW legally binding treaty or not for all member states? And does it take primacy over trade? Kindly help us understand. Um, takes over over what? Sorry, I got didn't trade. Get the... trade, trade, trade. Oh yes. wow. Okay. Um, first of all, yes, it's legally binding. Um, the wh whatever country ratifies, so one hundred eighty nine are obliged to implement the, um, the um, CEDAW convention progressively. Um, the problem here is that even though it is legally binding, not like in the national system where we have the police, in an international system, we don't have a police to actually enforce it. Um, so if a government, um, if a government don't want to, to implement certain things, there is not much for the CEDAW committee to do apart from strong recommendations. Of course, the donor community, the international community who provides funding and provides support could actually pick up on it and provide less support or shift their priorities. Um, there shouldn't be um, like, you know, it, it shouldn't be like that, that one right prevailed over the other. You can't say women rights don't prevail or prevail over trade or economic rights or cultural rights or rights for people with disability. That's not that's not how it works. Um, unfortunately, the reality is if something has to do with economic rights, they are often favored by by the government, and there is not much that the uh, international community can do because of state sovereignty. So that's all that I can say to it. Uh, thank you. And uh, Abhiti Gupta from India, who is working on women and queer rights issues, uh, has uh, just has an added uh, question to this one, that it is surprising that the United States has not ratified CEDAW, but it dominates the trade agenda. Can you yes. please throw some more light on it? Um, so yes, it, it, there are so many debates around that. Um, the official stand from the US is that they don't need it because they have all the women's rights um, obligation in their national um, uh, in their national legal framework already. And so they don't feel that they need to ratify. Um, they are they signed a while back, but that doesn't really mean that much. Um, so, you know, it's, it's politics um, and I'm, I'm always surprised. I mean, that the country like the United States wants to stand on the same level as Somalia, for example, when it comes to women's rights, but nobody can be forced. And um, uh, I, I don't see the United States ratifying CEDA anytime soon. They think they are beyond it. I, they think that they have better um, national, um, uh, national frameworks in place, so they don't need CEDA. Okay, uh, another question from Abhiti, that is CEDAW committee also eligible to give recommendations over the country level legislations. India uh, may bring stringent anti-trafficking laws, which are likely to affect the right to work for sex workers. Yes, definitely. That's actually something that the CEDAW committee does quite often. Um, so there, there are actually three, three kind of avenues that can be used. First of all is the CEDAW reporting. When India reports next time um, to, to the CEDAW committee, 
um, the civil society organization should make sure that the CEDAW committee knows about the law. So then they can actually issue general recommendations specifically on legislative change because it, it um, breaches women's rights. Um, the other avenue is if there is a specific example where a woman's rights was breached and she shouldn't get justice in her own country, the CEDAW uh, optional protocol can be used to claim their rights through the CEDAW committee. And on the, the third procedure, the inquiry procedure, if it's a systematic reoccurring breach in human rights, then the CEDAW committee could be triggered to actually go into the country and do their own little inquiry sort of investigation. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Carmen Zubega wants to know, can you give the difference between gender and development versus gender equality, disability and social inclusion? <laughs> is, is, there, is there a difference between that? Okay, let me, let me, let me see if I can find the, the question. Yes. So, the, so gender and development. Yes. And then gender, disability, and social inclusion. Yes. Yes. I don't actually I don't actually think that they're exclusive. Gender and development actually um, should just make sure that when it comes to development, that the gender specific needs are to take in, into consideration and also that the different sexes have the opportunity to contribute fully. Um, social inclusion, disability, and gender, it really stands for um, pretty much correcting what has been done over, over the history, that when it comes to women's rights, we always, always looked at uh, one specific group of women. Often there were privileged white women who had the right and the opportunity to claim their rights and everyone was considered a homogeneous group. So if we provide women's rights to one group, then it should automatically mean that everybody else has the right as well. We know now that is absolutely not the case. When we talk about women with disabilities, they have different, um, different problems, they have different needs, and they have different capacity to uh, contribute to women's rights. Same with indigenous women, same as with LGBTQI plus women and men for that matter. Um, so the social inclusion is really to, to make sure when we talk about gender equality, we don't talk about, we provide rights for women as a whole group. There are cross-sectional, there are um, um, multiple levers of discrimination and we have to address that um, by looking at the different groups and the need. It comes back to um, the point that I made um, to people centered. What we need to know first, and often the data and the statistics are lacking, that's a problem that we have in many countries. We first need to know what is needed. What do people need? We can't just assume that if you give a right to me, that a person with disability will have the same access I have. So it's really people-centered, make sure that we understand the issues of the different groups and then um, address that accordingly, based on needs, not based on assumption. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, Kai Laigo Valido uh, wants, is sharing an example from the Philippines that the, yeah. Philippines, uh, the Philippines submitted a request for inquiry through the optional protocol for gross violation of SRHR of women in Manila. Yeah. In 2015, CEDAW upheld the complaint and found the city of Manila liable for grave violations to women's rights, in particular to SRHR. Yeah. But I wish that we could make these local leaders accountable. It was like just issuing a ticket and a warning to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the inquiry, the CEDAW optional protocol depends a little bit of naming and shaming. Right. So we have sovereign states An international body can't tell them what to do. They only can highlight the issue and hope that the government is sensible enough to then implement it and don't want to be the people who violates the rights of their women. Unfortunately, that is not the mindset of many global leaders or governments. Um, 
So yeah, international law always has been an animal without teeth. Uh, so it depends pretty much on the goodwill and often on the, on the strength of the civil society organizations. But there we come to the other issue where we have limited civic space um, uh, dangerous um, governments for women human rights defenders, um, lack of protection and so on. So it's a very, very complex issue. And I definitely tell you, I would love to have a CEDO police. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, Irfan Ali Kokar from Pakistan wants to know what is substantive equality and what role can civil society play in the CEDO monitoring process? So substantive equality is uh, different than um, formal equality. Formal equality means that everybody gets the same rights, right? It comes a little bit back to what I explained earlier. Substantive equality is balancing the rights that, that have been originally not balanced. For example, when we talk about, um, let's talk about um, criminal justice. Um, sexual and gender-based violence is predominantly um, committed against women, right? So if we don't have legislation, that pre predominantly affects women and not men. So there is an imbalance. So if we talk about formal equality, we would just give the same criminal code for everyone and hope for the best. When we talk about substantive equality, we look at what is needed and then provide sexual and gender-based violence legislation so that women are protected. So substantive equality looks at what is needed to have a balanced and equal relationship and then provides the right measures. It's not necessarily that everybody gets the same rights. Um, for the um, how civil society organization can get involved in the CEDAW process, this is super important and that is what the whole CEDAW reporting cycle actually draws on. Um, the civil society organizations are super important, especially the shadow report. Um, those reports are actually highly valued by the CEDAW committee members because that, as you can imagine, when a government writes a report about issues of women rights in their country, they often don't want to highlight the issues that are not implemented yet. So they kind of, you know, don't mention them or mention them only briefly. While the civil society organization can give a more comprehensive picture of what really happens in the country. And with that, educate the CEDAW committee to, write the, to ask the right question and give the right recommendations. I also really recommend when your government goes to, to engage with the CEDAW committee in Geneva, Go with the civil society organization to also have your site events with the CEDO committee, because there you can then debate and, and pretty much put your questions and demands in the mouth of the CEDO committee to translate it um, into, into recommendation that the government should follow. Um, so staying informed about what your government does uh, when they are reporting how they want to implement the CEDAW recommendations are really important. And it gives you also a powerful tool to come together as women's rights movement. What I've noticed in many countries, you have super capable, strong civil society organization, but who work in silo. If you come together around the CEDAW general recommendation and you powerfully, as a group of women, uh, push for certain changes, you have a louder voice and you have more impact than individual civil society organization. Uh, Umanga, Set, uh, Umanga Setinaike from the Asia Foundation of Sri Lanka office says with reference to GR's link to the formal justice sector, the issue of independence and neutral approach to law continues to impact women negatively. Any thoughts on this issue and any good practices that may have come out from CEDAW recommendations to countries. Yeah, okay, so that, that's a tricky one. As I understand it, so we're really looking at independence uh, and uh, um, um, a formal justice system without bias, correctly? Yes. Okay, so the, the gender bias within, a, um, within a, the formal justice system is, is still quite large. 
um, even in countries where you would think that's not the case. I've just recently saw a study of uh, prosecutors in Europe where the average prosecutor thinks that 30% of the women who say that they were raped actually lie. The global rate of false accusations around about 8%, not 30. So the problem of um, bias within the justice system is still super high. And um, over the years, a lot of civil society organization have, or the UN, other international partners have, um, provided training to the police, provided training to prosecutors, judges, and that is super important. But I think what is more important is actually to start with law students, <laughs> because they will be our future judges, to actually in, have the gender component already in the curriculum when it comes to, to law universities, when it comes to law schools. The other one is institutions for, 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 for example, police academy, for example, um, judicial committees. Um, so ev everywhere where our justice providers are educated, it should be compulsory to have a gender component in there. So that is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that our justice system is overwhelmed. There, there are too many cases for too too few lawyers for too few prosecutors so even a prosecutor who has good intention and who wants to do everything right has too many cases on his or her desk to actually work through it and with that because sexual and gender-based violence is incredibly hard to prove in court a lot of those cases are dropped not because the prosecutor thinks that the woman lie but because the prosecutors also evaluated how many cases he or she wins. And um, SGBV cases are really hard to do in court. So we have to not just think about, oh, it's always the evil justice provider, but it's also the system that doesn't allow the good-willed and hard-working justice provider to do their job properly. Thank you. Yasoda Kura says, thank you very much for an excellent pre presentation, Doreen. And can CEDAW recommend on changes in mandatory reporting of sexual violence cases to the police in India? She's mandatory to... reporting. Yes. Um, no, they wouldn't. <laughs> um, not because they don't can. They can recommend pretty much everything what they think is right to do. Um, but mandatory reporting has backfired in other countries. There were um, countries where, um, for example, nurses or doctors, when they saw that there was domestic violence or sexual violence, they had to um, report to the police um, that something like that happened. But that takes the autonomy away from the women. The result of that was that women just don't, didn't go to the hospitals anymore. They didn't seek the health care they're so direly needed. And it's also, when you look at the formal justice system, if you decide to go through it, this is a traumatic experience. Just imagine something really <laughs> has happened to you. You had a, the worst experience of your life. And now you are forced to go through the justice chain and sit in front of a group of lawyers and people and the offenders to explain what happened to you. And then look at the, the attrition rate and look at the rates of, of offenders that are, actually, um, that are actually convicted. You might actually, as a woman, go through this case. You lose your family, you lose your community. Um, and at the end, the offender gets free. And the whole world pretty much tells you you're a liar. This is a super traumatic experience and nobody else but the woman should have the decision to go through that or not. Her autonomy, her autonomy was taken away why, while, she was, um, while she was sexually um, abused. And then you can't force her to go through the justice system just to make sure that the offender goes behind bars. It should always be her decision. Very, very true, Doreen, very true. Uh, Anne Neguin, I think she's in Australia these days. She thanks Doreen for her great presentation and asks, do you have any information on the practice of women's rights in Vietnam? Because Anne is from Vietnam. Uh, I'm currently working around the topic of women with disabilities in Vietnam. That's fantastic. 
actually we do have an office who and woman does have an office and we have an access to justice project there but i also would like to invite all of you whoever is interested um, to drop me a line i will put my email address in the chat um, because we are currently developing an access to justice strategy for the asia pacific region and we look at civil society who are interested um, to, um, to learn more about justice and how to make a difference in their country. So if, if you want to get engaged in that, if you want to push for justice for women in your country, um, drop me a line and I'll invite you to our next consultation. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's making me have promoting promoting my work here sorry <laughs> no, i couldn't no, resist <laughs> no, no. no but that's very pertinent also uh, shanta shreshtra from bbc and wants to know how can we feminist friends ensure implementation of cedo in countries like afghanistan where the government forces women even not to come out of the house as a feminist how can we help people of afghanistan and probably in a few other countries as well. Yeah, um, you know, this, this is super, this is super difficult because when you look at international law, the, you, you, you have the CEDA committee promote specific recommendations, but when you are in a country like Afghanistan and you promote this specific general recommendation, there are no protection mechanisms in place to protect you. Uh, and that is one of the major shortcomings. Um, so raising the awareness, um, making sure that people know what's actually happened in your country, bringing civil society organizations together because the, the power lies in numbers. That's just the way it is. As an individual woman human rights defenders, you're so vulnerable. Um, but what I would like to see, what I hope to see at a certain point is that international um, treaty bodies have stronger protection mechanisms for women who actually want to enforce in their country. But as long as there's state sovereignty, um, that won't be unfortunately the case. So at this point, I would really say advocacy, make sure that your voices are heard and then um, let, uh, let the international community know exactly what kind of help you need. Because often, um, as I said earlier, when I sit in Germany and I think about the situation of women in Afghanistan, I don't know what you really need. You need to tell me and then I can go to my government and see what I can do. So be very specific about what you need and um, yeah, advocate, advocate, advocate. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, la lastly, we have a comment from Hari Singh India who works for uh, HIV positive people and uh, he says that HIV positive people of India are not getting benefits of the HIV AIDS law which was passed in 2018 in the country and the reason again is poor implementation on the ground the state governments are not interested to notify and not provide social protection so again it is about implementation it's all about implementation and unfortunately it's 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 all around this, all around the world, the same situation. And it comes back to gender bias, no question, but it's also a, a lack of focus on minority groups. And it is, comes back to a justice system that was created 400, 500 years ago, when the only person who could claim rights was the white rich man. Uh, and we today still try to fit everything in there. Um, and often, uh, especially in many countries, um, it's a colonial system that doesn't really fit your context very well because there, there, there are other issues around it. Um, so on one hand, I always say, okay, there's, there's a lot of biases, there's a lot of discrimination happening, but it's a bigger picture. If your government and your justice system are not strong enough, it is a systematic issue not just an issue of individual people who don't want to do their job. Yes, and, and it's not just about the white rich man, we have many brown rich men also <laughs> <laughs> in countries where they yeah, are. Yeah, true that. <laughs> so, thank you, Doreen, thank you very much. Uh,
for this uh, vibrant interactive session.